because they looked at the temple that was being built and it didn't compare. And so Haggai encouraged them to look to the future glory that would come. So approximately a month after the second message of Haggai, in which he encouraged the people, we have Zechariah coming and he begins to preach. The year is around 518 B.C., okay? Remember, <clears throat> Israel, Judah's back out of captivity, 536, 537 B.C. They've come from Babylon back to their land, laid the foundation, 535, stopped the work for 15 years. Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet come and encourage them to build the temple of the Lord. So Zechariah starts his prophecy, as I said, about one month after the second message of the prophet Haggai. Okay, so verse 1. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo the prophet, saying, The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings, but they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers were, or where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they return, said, like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. In verse 7, upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month. So it's about two months. These visions come about two months after the last message of Haggai. Okay. Upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is in the month of Sabbat, the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, I saw by night, behold, a man riding upon a red horse. He will have eight to ten visions and twenty-four hour period of time. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight. We ask God your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy word, we ask God that you would inspire us to preach it, deliver it, and receive it. We thank you, Lord Jesus, tonight for your goodness and mercy. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your word tonight. We ask God that you would bless it, bless your people, and bless our efforts tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Zechariah, his name means... The Lord remembers. He is the son of Berechiah. Berechiah means blessed or comforted. And he is the son of Ido. Edo. Edo means the appointed time. So God remembers to bless in the appointed time. Here's the prophet Zechariah. I um, need to correct something I said last week. I said that Zechariah was the older prophet, older than Haggai. I uh, was mistaken on that, incorrect on that. Zechariah is the young man. Haggai is the old prophet, okay? All right, so they're contemporaries. So uh, Zechariah comes again to encourage the people to build the temple like Haggai did. The first eight chapters fall in that time frame. Zechariah in the first eight chapters is encouraging the people to build the temple of the Lord, okay? Chapter 9 through 14 takes you beyond that time of building the temple way into the future, okay? So let me divide it for you. First eight chapters, we have the encouragement of the prophet Zechariah to build the temple. Chapter 9 through 11, we have the judgment on nations. And then chapter 12 through 14, we have the future glory of Israel. You get that? Okay, Zechariah is the book of Revelation in the Old Testament. So, where you have the book of Revelation in the New Testament, the book of Apocalypse, Zechariah is the same kind of book for the Old Testament. So you could say it's the book of Revelation for the Old Testament. It is an apocalyptic book, which
which means it's full of signs and visions and imagery. It's full of angels. It's telling you your future. It's talking about the coming of the Lord. Okay? So that's why it's called apocalyptic. Because of all of those images, visions, uh, angels, predicting of the future, the coming of the Lord. That's why it's an apocalyptic writing. So it parallels the book of Revelation. In fact, really, Zechariah is the most important prophetic book in the Old Testament to understand the book of Revelation. Okay? Some people think it's the book of Daniel, that the book of Daniel is the key to the book of Revelation. Zechariah is the key to the book of Revelation. Okay? So that's how important the book of Zechariah is, this apocalyptic writing is. To understand the book of Revelation, you have to understand the prophet Zechariah. So it is the book of Revelation, if you will, the apocalypse of the Old Testament. Okay? Praise the Lord. Now, Zechariah starts out by warning the people. Okay? Again, right after the second message now of Haggai. Haggai encouraged the people to build by telling them about the future glory. Remember that? Okay, and they got busy doing the work of the Lord, Haggai breathing down their neck. Okay? He's a very fiery preacher. He comes with fires and fire in his eyes. He's telling the people of God the reason why you're in economic collapse and the reason why you're having so many problems economically, while there's mildew everywhere, etc., is because you've neglected the house of the Lord. And you're not working on the house of the Lord. So Haggai explains to them why they are having the economic problems that they are having. He's breathing down their neck. Okay? Firing his eyes. He gets them to work to build the house of God, to work on the house of God. Okay? He's the older prophet. Here comes Zechariah. He's the younger prophet. Preaching the same time Haggai is. Uh, Zechariah goes back and warns the people... Are you with me? Okay, remember they're discouraged, right? So Haggai's telling them, all right, there's a future glorious age that's coming. So build, looking forward to that. Zechariah, right after that message is delivered, he doesn't encourage them by the future glory. He warns them about the past. So he uses the past to motivate them, but he uses a warning to motivate them. Does that make sense? Okay. So Haggai's, Haggai's breathing down their neck, firing his eyes. He explains to them why they're having the problems they're having. They start working. He encourages them by looking to the future. Here comes Zechariah right after that second message of Haggai. And he says, this is the reason why you lost that former glory. It's because of your sin. Okay? And so he warns them, don't do it again. Because if you do it again, you're going to have the same problem as your daddy. Okay, so let's look at the warning of the prophet Zechariah. By the way, <clears throat> this glorious uh, prophet of the Lord, apocalyptic prophet of the Lord, was killed by these people. Matthew 23, 35, the Bible said Jesus said they slew him between the porch and the altar. Okay, <clears throat> well, hallelujah, that encourages me. No, that encourages you or not. You know, that encourages me. If you're called into the ministry, that's what you can expect from people. Woo. How does that encourage you, Pastor? It encourages me to go on no matter what I face. You know what I'm saying? You hear what I'm saying? Because if I read this prophet, this apocalyptic prophet from God, whose book is the key to understanding the book of Revelation in the New Testament, and after he gets through preaching to them, they take him and they kill him. They refuse to listen to him. They get in the rage and they kill this prophet. If they'll do that to this man, then why should any man or woman that's called to preach think that they're going to receive any less treatment from people than he did? And it will encourage me. Because I want to tell you something, people haven't changed. That old nature is the same in every one of us. That old, now, I know you're the people of God. You would never do that. But you've got an old nature inside of you. That if you let that old nature rise up in you, you're, that old nature is capable of killing the prophet.
prophets of God. And that's exactly what they did. So that's why you and I got to keep that old nature in check and subdued by the Spirit of God. Because if we don't, that old sin nature in us will cause us to do horrible things. And so these are the people of God. And they killed that prophet of the Lord. So isn't that a great way to start out the message? But I just wanted to encourage all of you who are called into the ministry, okay, this is what you can look forward to. Okay, and I've been at this for a little while. Uh, I've had good times and bad with people, okay, with me here today. But it's about what does God want you to do in your life, whether the people want it or not, whether they accept it or not, whatever. You have to do what God tells you to do. And you can't run from the call. So it's really sad that the people of God were like that. This awesome man of God delivering these awesome messages, but they still took him and they killed him. It's a sad deal. Amen. Well, praise the Lord, since I got your attention, I lift you up like that and encourage you. and Make you feel so good about yourself. Hallelujah. Your pastor telling you that this is what he has to look forward from you. Hallelujah. Death. You don't like it, but that's the way it is. I love you and I know you love me, but we still got a sin nature. Okay, so we got to keep it in control. All right, so here he comes. The prophet Zechariah comes warning them about the past. He tells them about the forefathers. He said the reason why they lost that glorious temple of Solomon and they were taken captive was because of their sins. And God said, he said, I sent the prophets to them. And the prophets preached to them. But God said through Zechariah, they would not listen to the prophets. They wouldn't repent of their sins. And as a result of their sin, their idolatry, God allowed that temple to be completely destroyed and the city destroyed and the people taken cap captive because of their sin. But God says in verse 3, He says, if you'll turn to me, I'll turn to you. He said, that, that is really the key verse of the prophet Zechariah. If you'll turn to God, God will turn to you. Amen. See, we want God's best. But before we can get God's best, He comes to us and says, I want your best. So God says, if you turn to me, He said, I'll turn to you. Don't go back and do what your forefathers did. Don't go into sin like they did and idolatry like they did. And cause the judgment of God to come upon them. Turn to me. He said, I'll turn to you. Praise the Lord. Now, the sad part about it is, is that the forefathers raised these kids. Are y'all with me? And I already told you, they took the prophet Zechariah and they killed him. They didn't listen to him. So they did the same thing that the forefathers did because when the prophets went to the forefathers, they slew the prophets and would listen to the prophets. The judgment of God came. And so here comes this prophet preaching to the kids. And the kids do the same thing to this prophet. They refuse to hear him and they kill him. Now, that tells me something and it should tell you something. Okay? And I'm not being judgmental. I'm just bringing the word of God to you tonight. That if you have people, if you're a parent and you're in the church tonight. If both parents in the church are not dedicated to God. It is impossible for you to raise a dedicated kid. So mom and dad, you and I need to look at our lives. I do too, just like you do. Okay. Am I really dedicated to the Lord? Am I dedicated to the house of the Lord? Well, if I'm not dedicated to God, and I'm not dedicated to the church, and Sister Christina is not dedicated to God, and Sister Christina is not dedicated to the church, then neither one of my children will be dedicated to God. It's impossible. It is impossible to have two people in the church that's not dedicated to God and have a dedicated child come out of that. It is impossible. It is possible to have one dedicated parent and one non-dedicated parent and have a dedicated child out of that arrangement. 
so if, if mom and dad are both in the church, but only one of them's dedicated, really dedicated to God, then it's possible that the kids will be dedicated to God because of that one parent that's dedicated to God. Or it is also possible if the home, the mom and the dad, is a home, is a sinner's home, that neither mom or dad are in the church, it is possible for a kid to come out of that sinner's home and be dedicated to God. So I'll say it to you again. Two parents in the church, not dedicated, no dedicated children. One parent in the church, possible dedicated children. Children come out of a sinner's home can be dedicated to the Lord. But never will you ever find a dedicated child when you have two undedicated people sitting on the pew. It'll never happen. So it's very important for you and I to raise our kids right and that they look at my life and they look at your life and they don't see a hypocrite at home. They don't see you one way when you come to church and one way when you go home and the one, you know, one way all week long and then all of a sudden you come to church and you're holy, holy, holy. Your kids know if you're dedicated or not. My kids know if I'm dedicated, and they know if Christine is dedicated. You can't play the game in front of the kids because you live. You can come to church, you put on a show and act like, hey, woo, and run. But your kids know. So it's important for us as parents to live dedicated before God so that our children will be dedicated. And because these forefathers of these kids were not dedicated and because they did not raise their kids right these kids didn't listen to Zachariah and they ended up killing him so because of the forefathers and commitment and dedication to God they produced children they raised kids that backstood away from God and so Zachariah starts out his message by preaching to kids of the forefathers and telling them don't do what daddy did <laughs> the sins of daddy the forefathers is what caused you to lose the glory of the past that you're crying and whining about said oh it was so great back then he said you lost that because of your sin and you wouldn't listen to the prophets and so he's telling the, the kids of those parents, don't do what daddy did. But they did. Because they looked at undedicated parents. And they duplicated the undedicated parent in their life. So Zacharias starts with that warning. Now, that's the way to prophesy, man. If you're going you're to encourage people to build the house of God, to build a temple of the Lord, that's, that's where you start, you know is you start warning, don't lose the glory by yielding to what mom and dad was like. Just because mom and dad backslid, just because mom and dad's lukewarm in the church don't mean you have to be. But it's going to be very hard. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, 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 you're okay. Now that I got you thinking. You came to God as a child later in life. And you say, but my mom and dad's not dedicated to the Lord right now. But when did you come to the Lord? When you were out of the house. So the point is, really, you were in a sinner's house all your life, and you went out on your own, and then you came to God. Hallelujah. Your parents might be in the church right now, and they're not dedicated, but because you bypassed, you understand that? That time in their life where they played the hypocrite. You can still be on fire for God. So, Zechariah comes along and he's preaching. He says, don't be like your forefathers. They lost that glorious temple, you know. And Haggai's saying, come on and build. Don't look back at the past. Look at the future glory. Zechariah comes along, the younger prophet, and he says, look at the past. I'm warning you. You're going to lose the glory that God gave you if you do what they did. Sin. Okay, praise the Lord. Woo! 
And it says, verse 3, Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. And the word Lord of the term, Lord of hosts for God, is used over 50 times in the prophet Zechariah. Around 18 times in the 8th chapter alone. The Lord of hosts. One Lord, one God, over a host, plural, a heavenly host of angels the host of Israel, and the host called the church. Within the host of angels, multitudes. Within the host of Israel, multitudes. Within the host called the church, multitudes of people, but one God. And so the prophet Zechariah calls him the Lord of hosts over 50 times. And I believe 18 times in the 18th chapter alone. He says, the Lord of hosts is coming and saying, well, turn unto me and I'll turn to you. I'll give you, God said, I'll give you my best if you give me your best. And Zachariah's trying to encourage them. Just like Haggai, come on, get busy. Let's build. Let's build the house of God. Let's build this temple. Praise God. Amen. And so God gives him a total of 10 visions in a 24 hour period of time, all of them dealing with the people of God. Ten vision. Can you imagine that? In a 24-hour period of time, God gives him these visions. And I'm, I'm going to preach the prophet Zechariah to you tonight, and I don't think it's going to take me 24 hours. I don't think. But I told my kids and my, my wife today, yay! It's the longest one in all of them. Hosea was, I think, 14 chapters. Zechariah, 14 chapters. And he's, he's probably a little longer than Hosea. And I, I'm so excited because 14 chapters of the Word of God. Hallelujah. And, I, and I'm going to try I'm gonna try not to keep you 24 hours. But he had 10 visions. Some people count eight. If you just listen to me, we'll cover them. If you count... The horns are the, 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 the carpenters, the smiths, with the horns as one vision. And you don't count the vision of the branch, you've got eight visions. If you separate the smith carpenter vision from the horn vision and you add the branch vision, that means you've got ten visions in the prophet Zechariah, beginning with verse 7 through chapter 6. And they all came to Zechariah in one 24-hour period of time, all eight slash ten visions in 24 hours dealing with the people of God, encouraging the people of God to build the temple. Okay, you with me? And after those visions, those eight slash ten visions given from verse 7 to chapter 6, chapter 7 and chapter 8 deal with a a delegation who come with a question about fasting and answers in relationship to fasting. And then 9 through 11, the judgment on the nations, and 10 through 12, the future of Israel is given. Does that make sense? Okay. So here we go. Y'all ready? Say, here we go. 14 chapters. Hallelujah. So I'm going to, um, now, all right, praise the Lord. I'm not going to be exhausted tonight. Here we go. I'm not going to be exhausted tonight. I'm not going to be microscopic tonight. I'm going to be telescopic tonight. That means I'm going to give you an overview of the prophet Zechariah, telescopically, okay? How many of you have a telescope? Pull a telescope up, and you look. And you see all that, all those stars up there. That's telescopic, okay? Microscopic is when you break it down, okay? So tonight, I'm going to give you telescopic view. We've already given you a microscopic view. It's on, I believe it's on DVD, isn't it? We have, we have the prophet Zachariah on DVD in a microscopic form 
and CD, okay? So if you don't get all the details you want tonight, remember, we've already done a microscopic view teaching of the prophet Zechariah, okay? Praise the Lord. So tonight, in less than 24 hours, I'm going to give you a telescopic view of the prophet Zechariah. We already started out telling you, okay? Now he started his ministry with warning. Let's look at the visions. <clears throat> Upon the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Sabbat, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Ezo, Edo, the prophet, saying, so now, This is approximately two months after Haggai's last message. Okay, you with me? And what was Haggai's last message? He was talking about false authority removed and true authority established. That throne of Satan defeated and the kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's the last message from Haggai to Zerubbabel. Okay, the removal of false authority and the establishment of true authority. And here comes Zechariah about two months after that last message, and he gets these visions from the Lord. Okay, you ready? First vision. I saw by night, behold, a man riding upon a red horse. He stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom. And behind him were their red horses speckled and white. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what are these? angel that talked with me said unto me I will show thee what these be and the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said these are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth and they answered the angel of the Lord and they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said we have walked to and fro through the earth and behold all the earth sitteth still and is at rest then the angel of the Lord answered and said O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the city of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years? Okay. Remember, they're back in the land after that seven-year captivity. And the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. So the angel that com communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great jealousy, and I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease for I was but a little displeased and they helped forward the affliction say help forward the affliction therefore thus saith the Lord I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies my house shall be built in it saith the Lord of hosts and the line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem Amen. cry yet saying thus saith the Lord of hosts my cities through prosperity prosperity shall yet be spread abroad and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion and shall yet choose Jerusalem and so the first vision that Zechariah is given he's given a picture of a rider on a red horse following these other horses describes their colors and we have a conversation from an angel to uh, from an angel with the Lord okay and uh, what is happening is God is saying, uh, the vision is taking place among the myrtles. And it's in the bottom. Okay? It's in the valley. And that's where the soil is very, very rich. And that's where the myrtle trees are growing. And so we see the angel talking to the Lord. Okay? And uh, he's questioning the Lord. He's interceding if you will on the behalf of Israel okay and uh, as I said it's in the shady place it's at the bottom it's a picture of Israel slash Judah etc they have lost their position of prominence in the earth okay they're overshadowed by the kingdoms of the world now remember that these prophecies the Haggai specifically the date is given in connection to a Gentile ruler, which lets you know that you're in the time call, the time of the Gentiles. Luke 21, 24 talks about the times of the Gentiles. So when Haggai is preaching, Zechariah is preaching, Gentiles 
are in power over Israel. So the Gentile world powers dominating uh, Israel at this time. That's why God says it's the time of the Gentiles. That's why he dates it with a Gentile ruler. Okay. All right, say amen. The times of the Gentiles start with the Babylonian captivity, and they go all the way to the second coming of Jesus, when Jesus comes back to the earth and overthrows Gentile powers off of Israel. Okay? So what we see in the passage then is in the time of the Gentiles, when the Gentiles are overpowering Israel and taking them captive. We had a Syrian captivity, Israel. We had the Babylonian captivity, Judah. You with me? So the times of the Gentiles now, where Gentile power is in control over Israel. Now, well, what does God think about these Gentile world powers overshadowing his people and bringing them into captivity or shadow lands in the bottom? One translation in the bottom means shadow land. So they're overshadowed. They're seen in captivity. They're under the control or the power of Gentile nations. You with me so far? Now, <clears throat> these nations that are around Israel at this time, God is looking at the situation, and he's sending these scouts, these angel scouts, these spiritual horses, if you will, with riders throughout the earth to look at those world powers that are dominating Israel. And God is not happy because those Gentile powers, Babylon for one, took Judah into captivity, but they went too far with, even though God used those Gentile powers to correct his people so they would return to him. Those Gentile powers enjoyed the judgment, okay? They enjoyed afflicting Israel and taking them captive and they went too far with what they did to the nation of Israel and so God is looking there in the shadowy place the bottom here and this angel's talking to the Lord about Israel and about all these Gentile powers around that these scout horses have gone forth to check out and to view um, and what is God's thinking? What is God, uh, how does God feel about the situation of the Gentile powers uh, taking judgment too far and overpowering Israel and all this thing that's going on? Are you with me here right now? And in the myrtle trees, well, the myrtle tree is Israel. That's God's people in the shadow place. The myrtle tree is a rare Wood. It's very rare. Israel is one of only a few places in the entire world that will grow myrtle, myrtle wood. It's a little short tree that's very bushy on the top, and it creates a beautiful aroma. And so God is saying, I'm aware of where Israel is. All these world powers that are overshadowing Israel and then some of them taking them captive he said I'm aware about you know what's going on I'm in control of the nations he said but I want you to know that even though they're surrounded by these powers and it's possible that these riders on the other horses are not only angel scouts it's possible that they are pictures of Gentile powers so that the riders on those horses are not good riders and so here Israel is in the bottom in the shady place of myrtle trees and he's got these other horses around them, world powers, you know, like Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, you know. I think there's three of them that follow the angel of the Lord, so I'm not going to try to venture as to which one it is, but it's Gentile powers. And so they're around Israel, they're looking and they can see these powers if these horses the riders on those horses represent those powers. And God is saying, you are like the myrtle tree to me. 
You are overshadowed right now. You are overpowered right now by Gentile powers, and they have taken it too far, even though God has used them because of their sin, to cause Israel to turn back to him. He said, you're rare to me. You're like the myrtle tree in the bottom, in the shady place. And uh, God knows that uh, they're concerned about the captivity, and God knows they're concerned about Gentile powers. We saw what Haggai's response was to, to Zerubbabel, his concern about those powers, and I'm not going to go back to that. But God is speaking comfortable words to them, hallelujah to the Lamb, that you are rare to me, and you are fragrant to me. You produce a beautiful aroma to me, and I am aware that the world powers around you are at ease. Uh, when they look at your affliction, they don't really care about your affliction. In fact, they have been used by the Lord to afflict you, but they've taken it too far. So God is letting them know, okay? Uh, God is going to respond to this angel. Give them some comfortable words. Speak some comfortable words uh, to them. Say praise the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And he says, watch this. Uh, praise God. Verse 14, verse 13 says, Tell him some good words and comfortable words. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great jealousy. He said, I know right where you are. Even though you've been in captivity, God said, I, know, I knew where you were, and you're like a myrtle tree, rare to me and fragrant to me, uh, and I'm not done with you. I'm not through with you. Get to building. When you come out of that captivity, get to building because there's a future glory that's coming. And, and Jerusalem will, will exist forever. Unlike these other powers that you're concerned about, Jerusalem will exist forever and ever. So get to building the temple. And over a period of time, Jerusalem will be rebuilt and the wall will be rebuilt. Get busy building this city and this temple because it's going to exist forever. God says, I'm aware of these powers around you that you're worried about, that you're concerned about. He said, but I'm jealous for Jerusalem. You're my rare people. You're my remnant. You're my... So get to building. Hallelujah. It is, it's going to be all right. Praise God. God's got a great plan for Jerusalem. Amen. Hallelujah to the land. Jerusalem is the center of Israel, and the center of Jerusalem is the temple. And so God says, get to building. Get to work. I'm going to encourage you here. Even though you've got these powers that are going to rise up even beyond the Babylonian captivity, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, and they will subdue uh, Jerusalem. He said, get building because Jerusalem has a future. Because God says, I'm jealous for Jerusalem. Build the temple that's the center of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is the center of Israel. And so no matter what happens with the Gentile world powers, God says, it's going to be okay in the end. I've got a glorious plan. Are you with me now? Now, you've got to hang with me just a minute because they were concerned about the Gentile powers in their day. Okay? Babylon is going to descend, following the Babylonian, the Medo-Persia, and then the Greeks and the Roman Empire. They're going to be concerned about these powers. But God is going to say, all of these powers that you will face in the not-too-distant future, God says, I'm going to defeat them. They're going to go too far. God said, I'm going to judge him. And it's a picture of what God is going to do at the end of the times of the Gentiles when he comes back and defeats them at the war of Armageddon. So there's a lot going on in the passage here. It has to do with Zechariah's day and that immediate future. And it has to do with the future. Okay? Coming to the Lord and setting up of the kingdom. And who will be the head of the nations in the kingdom age? Jerusalem. So get to build in the city, get to build in the temple, build the wall, because it has a glorious future. It will exist forever, eventually when Jesus comes back and sets up the kingdom. Hallelujah to the Lamb. So he's encouraging the people in the midst of these world powers that are around them, letting them know, I know you're overshadowed right now, you're in the bottom, but you're the myrtle tree. And I'm very jealous for you, you're rare, and you're, you're, you're very fragrant to me, and, and, and you've got a great future. So Zachariah is using this to encourage them to build, build, build. Hallelujah. Praise God. Say amen. 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 Woo. Verse 15. 
verse 16, he says, Therefore thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts. And a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Now remember, Zechariah is preaching at the same time Haggai, and he's encouraged them to build the house. And God says, it's going to be built. It's going to be built. He's prophesying the, the work is going to be finished. Get after it, get to building, get to working, get, build that temple. God said, it's going to be completed. Are y'all with me? Now, and that very temple is the one that Jesus will walk into. You understand. Praise the Lord. So, in the midst of the enemies, God is saying, I know they've taken it too far, but you're my people. I'm jealous for you. Get to build it. And then, verse 17, cry yet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, my, my cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion and shall yet choose Jerusalem, hallelujah, to the land. You've got a glorious future, God is saying. You've come out of captivity. You've made your way back home. It doesn't look too good. It doesn't look like you uh, hoped it would when you came back. And, uh, it, you know, and the building of the temple is, doesn't have the glory of, of Solomon's temple. But he's saying, go ahead and build because I've got a glorious plan for Jerusalem in the future. Praise God. And I'm well aware of all these Gentile world powers that have overshadowed you. And right now, you're in a low place. Right now, you're not too glorious. Right now, your position is not great. And, but he said there's coming a time through prosperity. Woo, hallelujah to the Lamb. Mm, say praise God. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, my, my cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. Hallelujah. Isn't that great news? It doesn't look too good right now. And the reason why it doesn't look too good is because you haven't been building the house of God. And so we're in an economic collapse. Hallelujah. And you're worried about these powers around you. But he said, I've chosen Jerusalem. And this is what the future holds for Jerusalem. And you're in the bottom right now, but it's not always going to be like that. You're not always going to be at the bottom forever. God said, I'm going to buy prosperity. He said, the cities are going to spread out. Hallelujah. By, by way of prosperity. Isn't God good in the house tonight? Now. It not only applied to Zechariah's day and Haggai's day, as they're coming back to restore, but it reaches way up in the kingdom age when Jerusalem will be the head of all the nations. And its territory will be so vast. Uh, we've already talked about how vast it's going to be and what territory it will cover in the previous minor prophets. But it's going to be huge, the spreading out of Jerusalem in those cities. Are you all with me right now? They will possess much of the territory of their present-day enemies. Woo! Hallelujah to the Lamb. So as God goes forth today, because really this vision is not just a picture of Zechariah's day. It's a picture of this day. As God sends those horses forth, those scout riders, to check out all the enemies that want to bring Jerusalem down. God says, they're my myrtle. They're special. There's a glorious future awaiting them. He said, I know about the way the Gentile powers look at you. Uh, they, they're not cared about your affliction, but there's a glorious day coming. So there's more than one fulfillment in the prophecy. Do you see that? Glorious days are coming, he's saying. So get, bu get busy building the temple. Get busy building the city. Get busy building the wall, Nehemiah. Praise God. Oh, isn't that great? That's great. And, and then all of a sudden, he sees the second vision. Hallelujah to the Lamb. He sees these four horns. And in the Bible, every time you see a horn, a horn in the Bible always speaks of Gentile world powers. We learned that in Daniel chapter 7. Gentile world powers, okay? So God says, I'm aware of these Gentile world powers, these four horns that will come up and they will wreck your city. They are God's wrecking crew. They're going to come up, these Gentile powers, uh, you're going to have Babylon, Babylon, you're going to have Medo-Persia, you're going to have Greece, and you're going to have Rome. Four horns, they're going to, to wreck the city. They're going to come in and plunder the city, these Gentile world powers. Now remember, what are they under? The times of the Gentiles, Gentile dominion, okay? All right, let's look at it, second vision. Thus, I then lifted up my eyes and saw, behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah 
Israel and Jerusalem. Now, it doesn't tell us exactly who the horns are. Now, you shouldn't be bored. What I'm giving you is some of the most important teaching you'll ever hear in your life. You don't really get it right now, but maybe when you get older, about 30 or 40 years old, it'll mean something to you, and you can get the tape then. But this is some of the most important thing I can give you. It is the key to understanding the book of Revelation. Okay? So God doesn't tell us who these four powers are, these four Gentile powers. But as we look at history, we can determine that Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome uh, dominated uh, Israel, Jerusalem, and Judah. Are you all with me here today? It could be that we could back up just a little farther and, and talk about Assyria taking Israel captive. Okay. So anyway, the whole point is this. God is numbering four Gentile world powers that will be his wrecking crew. He's going to use them to go in and wreck the city and judge the city because of the city's sin against God. Amen? Say praise the Lord. Now, it doesn't take a lot of brains to wreck the church. It doesn't take a lot of brains to be in a wrecking crew. You know, that if, if I want to tear something down, I don't have to have a lot of brains. Just give me a sledgehammer. Say praise the Lord. Say amen. Well, God says, I'm going to use these four horns, these four Gentile powers, and they're going to be my wrecking crew. It doesn't take a lot to go in and, and destroy, you know, Jerusalem. Praise God. You know the history, right? But God says, after the wrecking crew, after those Gentile world powers, uh, Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, and Rome come in and destroy this city. He said, I've got some carpenters or some smiths. They are the builders of the city. That brings us to the third vision. So the next vision, after God's wrecking crew, God gives him these, these vision of the carpenters. They are builders, are smiths. They are builders. They are skilled builders. It don't take much to destroy something, but it takes skill to build something. And so God says, I've got some smiths or some carpenters. They're going to go in and they're going to build what the Gentile powers have destroyed. Who are these smiths? Who are these builders? Who are these skilled laborers that know how to build God's church? They are prophets. They are priests. They are men of God. Not just anybody can build a church. Not anybody. Praise the Lord. Maybe, Maybe that's why I haven't done very well. At, at, at pastoring or building a church because I don't have the, the, the necessary skill set or level to build. But there are some men that are tremendous builders of God's kingdom. They are fantastic. They are magnificent. They know how to build a church. Like I said, anybody can tear one up. Just a few decisions can mess up a whole church. A few mistakes. Hallelujah. So the wrecking crew, anybody can go in and wipe. I can, let me tell you something. Somebody can come in this church and wipe it out real fast. It doesn't take much brains to do it. Amen. But it takes skill to build something. You've got to have an architect. You've got to have blueprints. You've got to have a plan. You've got to have plumbers. You've got to have electricians. You've got to have, come on somebody, somebody that knows what they're doing. Hallelujah. Now, I know some of you don't have a problem with with hiring Uncle Bob to come into your electricity uh, or Uncle Bob to come into your plumbing, praise the Lord. Uh, If he's not skilled, he can mess up everything in a short period of time. Normally, if you're going to build and you care about what kind of building you're going to come out with, you're going to have somebody that knows what they're doing with electricity and plumbing, hallelujah to the Lamb, praise God. Somebody that knows how to draw plans and do architecture, you know, do surveys, stuff like that. You don't just ask anybody to do those things. It takes skilled people to build something. Hallelujah to the Lamb. If anything is ever done in the kingdom of God, it was somebody that had some skill from God to do it. Now, like I said, anybody can tear up a church. It wouldn't take nothing for me to tear up this. But it takes a lot of skill from God to build it. So God said, I've got some smiths. I've got some carpenters that's going to follow the wrecking crew. Some builders that's going to follow the demolition crew. And they're going to build that thing back up so they're not going to leave it desolate and destroyed. God said, I can't let it stay desolate because I've got a plan for it. It's glorious. So get somebody that can build it. Get somebody with
us some skill. Give me some prophets. Give me some priests of God. Give me some anointed men that have wisdom and know how to build a church. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And so God is sending after his wrecking crew. He's sending the smiths or the carpenters to do the building. Say amen. Give the Lord some praise in the house. Woo. Now. All right, I, I think I won't read it all to you because you got it. All right, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, and then in chapter 2, God gives him another vision. And in that 24-hour period of time, he gives him a vision, hallelujah, of a man with a measuring rod in his hand. Give God praise in the house. So verse 1, he lifted up his eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, whither goest thou? And he said unto me, thou, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof, and what is the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, uh, and another angel went out to meet him. He said unto me, run, speak to this young man, Zechariah, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. He said, tell that this individual that's got this measuring line in his hand, don't measure the city. It's going to be too big for you to measure it anyway. It's going to spread out so large that you're not going to be able to measure it anyway, so don't measure it. And, and God is saying, by the way, there's coming a time when you're not even going to have a wall to protect you. It's going to be so big there, there won't be a wall around that city. So God says, I'll be the wall of fire round about it. God said, there's coming a time in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's going to be so large. Are y'all with me today? Obviously, this is reaching way up into the kingdom age. When the king of the north, Babylon, is, is attacking Israel in the future, God's going to be a wall of fire round about her to protect her. When the Antichrist and the war of Armageddon Breaks out in Jerusalem. God's going to be a wall of fire round about her and in the midst of her. So tell this man that's going out there to measure the city. It's just too big for you to do that. There's not going to be a wall. He said, God said, I'm going to be the wall of fire round about her. I'm going to protect her. Woo. And when her enemy's coming against her, God says, I'm going to take care of her. I'm going to be a wall of fire around her, and I'm going to dwell in the midst of her. That's what. So when the builders get through building, this is how glorious the city is going to be, how large the city is going to be, and what kind of wall is going to be for that city? God himself is going to be a wall of fire round about her and in the midst of her. Again, this is reaching way up in the kingdom age. Say amen. Now, the other prophets talk about the city. There's going to come a time when it will be a city that honors God. It's going to be a glorious city that honors God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. That serves the Lord. Praise God. That's future. It's not like that right now. It's in the future, praise God. What we're talking about. Now, God, I believe, is protecting the city. But we're talking about something glorious that you can't even measure. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now. So after he gets through with that fourth vision, and then he sees a, we see another vision, the fifth vision. He sees a, a vision of God's priest. Now look at it, if you would, please. Are you all with me here? I'm, I'm, I have to move quickly. Praise the Lord. Now, if, and he keeps talking about it, and he keeps talking about what is going to happen in Jerusalem. It's going to be uh, the center of the whole earth, and God is going to be in the midst of it. Praise the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord praise. Chapter 3, next vision, the, the fifth vision. He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan, standing at his right hand to resist him. See, when, when God uses somebody to start building the work of the Lord, like these builders did, and the future vision, the glory of Israel, the largest of Israel, and God being a wall of fire around her, and, and he's going to be in the middle of her, and she's going to be the center of the world. In fact, today she still is the center of the world. If you were to go high enough and drop a plumb line down, you would find the very center of this planet is Jerusalem. 
and in the center of Jerusalem where the temple would be located, where the Holy of Holies would be, that would be the exact center of the whole planet. It's the center of the universe. So God has given this, this glorious picture of the future when Jerusalem will be so large and so vast, there will be no wall to protect it, that he'll be the wall protecting it. He's going to be back on the earth in the midst of her, and she's going to be the center of the whole earth. Hallelujah. But when we see all of this vision and building and glory, we see be, uh, over the next vision, we see Satan is there trying to resist it. Now, the devil, have I lost you? Okay. The devil is always going to be resisting the building of God's church. He's always going to be resisting the building. Amen. One, one uh, child asked uh, the fa their father or the grandfather, says, can you tell me any good thing about the devil? Can you tell me one good thing about the devil? And the man said, in response to the child, yeah, he goes to church. <laughs> one good thing. He goes to church. When some church people don't go to church, the devil, listen, listen to what I'm telling you, he's always at church. Always. I remember we was in Taiwan, and we were preaching over in Taiwan. And, and as we were in the process of ministering there, the Lord gave me this, uh, took me in the spirit to this particular chapter uh, about how the devil was trying to resist the work of the Lord. And I believe God, remember, Sister Christina, I remember God was telling me that the enemy is trying to rise up to stop Brother and Sister Edmonds from doing a work in, in, in China. It's a prophetic word to that house. Well, it's not some, you know, unique prophecy. You ought to know that whenever somebody's trying to do the work of God or to build the kingdom or build a church, get ready. There's always going to be Satan standing there resisting the work. And where is the devil going to be? He's going to be right there in the church house. Standing there resisting the work. Being an accuser of the brethren. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And so... Here we see Joshua here. Praise the Lord. He's the priest. Zerubbabel is the governor, as you know. He's standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan's standing at his right hand to resist him. That's what he's still, he's still doing that today. He's, he, he's doing that to this church. He's doing that to people in this church who are trying to build the church. Rising up to resist what God is trying to build. Say amen. Spiritual battle. And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke thee. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I want you to notice something. God doesn't enter into a conversation with Satan. He just says, hey, the Lord rebuke you. You're trying to resist the work of God. You're trying to hinder the work of God. God says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. And that's the same thing that God said over there in Taiwan to Satan. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Are y'all here today? Now, woo, see, and wow. And I, I really didn't have a, a total complete picture because Brother Edmonds didn't tell me everything that's going on in the church. But there, he was having some problems with some people in the church. And before we got through preaching the word of God, the man was standing up confessing and repenting. Because the Lord, before I went there, showed me in vision that there was a man rising up against Brother Edmonds. And I went there, and God began to uncover that. Are y'all with me? He stood right up in the middle of a service and repented and confessed the sin. So where is he going to be? Right there in the church, using somebody. To resist God's priest. Now Joshua, he's got filthy garments on, you know. Hallelujah. The Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Yeah. See, Joshua, the priest, is a picture of the people. He said, I plucked them out of the fire. They're like a firebrand plucked out of the fire. 
He said, I'll pluck, I'll pluck, in them. I'll pluck them right out of Babylonian captivity. They're like a firebrand in the fire. Well, that's exactly what God did for every one of you tonight. He reached down and pulled you right out of hell. He pulled me out of the hell. As a firebrand, puck, puck from the burning. That's what he did for you. And that's what he did for me. Joshua is a picture of the people. God said, I pulled them out of the, like a firebrand out of the burning fire. I thank God that's exactly right. He pulled me right out of hell. He pulled. Now Joshua's got these filthy garments on and Satan's trying to resist him. Amen. He answered and spake unto those that stood by him, saying, He didn't talk to Satan other than rebuking him. But he looked at those that were standing by, by Joshua, and I don't know who they were. I don't know who they were. But he says, Take the filthy garments. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to have to pass from thee and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment and I said let them set a, fire, a fair mitre upon his head Ooh, a mitre, a kingly crown on the head of Yeshua on the head of Joshua the son of Josedek take his filthy garments off of him and put a fair mitre on his head a crown so he will depict Yeshua in a priest-king ministry. Say amen. We've got to get rid of God. is saying, all right, we brought you back into the land. We're telling you to build the temple. You're building the temple, praise God. New temple. You're going to build the city. But we've got to deal with that old polluted priesthood. We've got to get rid of a corrupt priesthood out of the church. We've got to get rid of pornography out of the church. We've got to get rid of sin out of the church. We've got to get rid of pollution out of the church. That old pollution of Eli, that old priesthood of Eli, that corrupt priesthood. God said, we've got to get rid of that corrupt priesthood. We have a new temple. We've got to have a new priesthood. And God said, take the filthy Garments, the polluted garments off. Get rid of that old, corrupt, polluted priesthood. And establish a new priesthood. A king priest ministry. His name is Yeshua. Give God praise in the house. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Does it make sense to you tonight? Let me tell you something. Do you remember Lazarus? Lazarus comes out of the grave. Who raised him from the dead? Who brought him out of the grave? Jesus did. What did he tell the, the, those that were standing by Lazarus to do? He comes. I don't know how long it took him. They had to have a lot of patience. When Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. I've already preached to you. He had to go a long ways, man. And it was a miracle because he couldn't even see where he was going. He was blindfolded and bound. And God said, Jesus says, loose him and let him go. Well, they didn't take his grave clothes off of him. They took the thing that bound his hand and the thing that bound his feet. They took his blindfold off of him so he could see and speak. But they didn't take the grave clothes off of him. When he went home that day, he could walk because they took the thing that bound him. He could move his hands because they took the thing that bound the hand and he could talk and he could see because they took the blindfold off. But when he went home, he wore his grave clothes home that day. 
which means when he got home, he had to take the grave clothes off. When he got home, he had to remove the grave clothes. If you come to the house of God tonight, and the Spirit of the Lord is here, and he's going to take the blindfold off of you, and he's going to take the, bind, the, the things that bind your hand and bind your feet. But when you go home, and when I go home, you are responsible, and I am responsible to get rid of the sin out of our lives. You've got to get those old grave clothes out of your house. Say praise the Lord. So God is saying here, we got to get rid of that polluted priesthood. That old Eli backslidden, polluted, corrupt priesthood. Whose sons commit sin in the tabernacle. Fornicate with the women that go to the church house. And steal the offerings of God Almighty. So we got to get rid of that Eli system. That polluted, corrupt system that's immoral. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Got a new temple, got to have a new priest. Put some clean garments on him. Now, I don't have time to preach all this to you. That's something you get on the message, the, the other series, okay? He said, I will clothe thee with the change of raiment. And he said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head. He clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts. And I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. Behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Say praise the Lord. Give God praise. He said, I'm going to see he's setting up a priesthood through the Melchizedek priesthood, the king priest ministry of Jesus. That's how all these previous visions are going to come to pass. The glorious future is going to come to pass through that person. Through a king priest type of ministry, through through that type of anointing. But I want to thank God tonight because He's pulled me out of the flame. And and hold on. And I know you're just you're listening and you're thinking, so I'm not gonna indict you, but some of you've already got self righteousness about you. He's the one that pulled you out of hell. He's the one that took your sin, your filth, and said, give him a clean garment and put you in a priest-king ministry. Yeshua did it. So we come to the next vision. Is it the sixth one? Yeah. One, two, three, four. Is it four? Five. No, I'm, we're five. Okay, five. The branch. Is it six? Okay. We got the myrtles. We got the horns. We got the smiths, carpenters. We've got, yeah, the measuring. I missed that. The man with the measuring line. And we got Joshua. And we got the branch. Good. Okay. Good, good. Six vision. Vision of the branch. Say the branch. This is the title of Jesus in the kingdom. Branch of the Lord. The branch of the Lord. This branch is God come in human form. The one that was a wall of fire around about Jerusalem was a man who is God. God come in human form. The priest here is a picture of Jesus Christ. Joshua is a picture of Jesus Christ, but is a picture of the people that have been delivered from hell and and been given clean garments. Are y'all with me today? Pollution have been removed. And now we focus once again on the branch, the God-man, the branch of the Lord that will rule in the kingdom age. And so he has this glorious vision of the branch. He says, he said, I'll bring forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the engravings thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. 
In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall they call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. And so this jumps way into the future when Jesus comes back. He said, I'm going to remove the iniquity of that land in one day. I'm going to remove the pollution of Israel in one day when he comes back to the earth. He's going to cleanse her when she repents of that defilement and that pollution and that sin. He's going to cleanse her when she calls out and seeks him and repents. And it's the branch, it's God in human form coming back that's going to do that. Say praise the Lord. 